So I just am here to welcome you um, to this really exciting talk that we have um, today. This is the third in our fall series of Seeds of Justice. And we have had two wonderful speakers and we have another one coming right up in a few minutes. Uh, I want to thank the Episcopal Community Services grant um, for giving us um, this opportunity to, to get this series going for a second year. And uh, the grant committee is made up of Anne Liu, Juliet Beck, and Alessa Johns. So thank you all for, for doing what you've done and what you continue to do um, to make this land-based ministry and Seeds of Justice program the success that it is so far. Um, so I think those were those were the pieces I wanted to share with you. I wanted to say welcome, wanted to talk about how we're doing the Q&A and um, that you're being record, we're all being recorded if you show up on camera and, uh, and I don't wanna waste too much time. So I am going to hand it over to Anne for a land acknowledgement. Good evening, everyone. I would like to begin this land acknowledgement as a duty to grow community and inclusion and to honor and make visible our relationship with Native peoples. We acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of Patwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Patwin tribes. Kachildihi Band of Winton Indians of the Calusa Indian Community, Kletzaldehi Winton Nation, and Yochadihi Winton Nation. The Patwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here on their native land, on their traditional lands. Thank you. I would like to introduce Alessa Johns, who will introduce John. Thank you, Anne. Um, I'm happy to introduce Professor John Liu. He's a professor emeritus in the departments of Asian American Studies and Sociology at the University of California, Irvine. Um, he founded the Asian American Studies program there and later established it as a department. He was associate editor of Amerasia Journal, the oldest journal in the field of Asian American Studies, and also a co-founding editor of the Journal of the Association of Asian American Studies. His areas of concentration are in race-ethnic relations, comparative studies of ethnic communities, comparative international immigration studies, and social theory. His interests in labor are an outgrowth of his dissertation work on Asians and the in, uh, Hawaiian sugar plantations, as he was talking about earlier, and I hope uh, we'll expand upon at some point. Um, and this is when he began studying the interaction, as he mentioned, between race and ethnicity, two phenomena that are intertwined in immigration, both to the United States and internationally. Uh, so thank you, Professor Liu, for joining us and offering your insights on how manifest destiny changed the color of labor. John? Hi. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I thought I would start off my presentation by first talking about how these three uh, presentations have been made, the two presentations before me and my presentation are linked. And for that, uh, I want to say that all our uh, presentations are rooted in this triadic relationship between the social relationships among people, the land, and the environment. And the first two lectures really, really talked about restoration of the land, how uh, removing dams, engaging in cultural burns are uh, not only restoring the lands, but also allowing the people who occupied that land originally to retain their cultures and to retain their sense of being. Uh, this discussion 
differs in uh, in that regard because unfortunately I'm not going to be talking about restoration or uh at all uh, on on the uh, contrary I'm really going to be talking about the despoilation of the land and to understand why that is when you talk about uh something like manifest destiny we have to understand that land has a very different meaning than it does to many indigenous people, because land in the capitalist economy is alienable. And what that simply means is that people have the right to buy it, to sell it, to use it in any way they want. And often this land is obtained, uh, in the beginning at least, uh, uh, by force. Now, land expansion, ownership, it's the ideological core of a doctrine like manifest destiny. And this occurred, this expand, land expansion that I'm going to be talking about right now, I'm going to be focusing mainly on Hawaii and mostly California, but also Hawaii uh, from the period from the 1840s to the onset of World War II. Now, when we talk about land expansion, we really have to keep that all types of land expansion share certain common elements. And that these common elements start with a sense of superiority. Uh, people who expand and try to take other people's land always start out with a sense that they are superior in some way to the people that they're subjugating. And along with that notion of superiority and domination comes this idea of dehumanization. You know, the dehumanization uh, runs a range from, well, they're merely uncivilized. We will teach them our ways and they will learn to be better human beings all the way to the uh, other end of the range that these people are inhuman and they need to be totally exterminated. So the forms of subjugation often depend on the degree of dehumanization. But as I will point out later, when people acquire land, especially where the cultures of the people are very different from the conquering people, then uh, it often requires the movement of non-native people into that territory that has uh, been acquired. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But what I want, do want your people to keep in mind is that when we talk about his, uh, uh, land expansion, uh, expansion within historical periods, we're not talking about a short period of time. We are talking about centuries of time. And Manifest Destiny, even though we're talking about the United States, is rooted in a much longer time period, which we will talk about. And that much larger context is the expansion of Euro-American supremacy in the global economy. We often think of the United States only in terms of 1775 on. But you really have to understand, we are outgrowth of Western Europe. And Western Europe begins its expansion roughly at uh, during the 15th century. Uh, many of you who are fortunate to have taken world history in high school or college will remember that at the end of the 15th century, in the 1490s, the Pope divided the world between two countries, Spain, and Portugal. All of the New World went to Spain, and all the uh, the, uh, the Eastern Hemisphere, uh, Western Eastern Hemisphere, went to Portugal. And later, those boundaries were adjusted, and that's why uh, Portugal got uh, Brazil in exchange for uh, Spain, who got the Philippines. And that's why in Brazil they speak Portuguese, and why many people in the Philippines have Spanish surnames. But the idea was the world was beginning to be divided, first by the Spaniards and the Portuguese, and then for a short interim by the Dutch 
But the main struggle was between England and France. And again, this is a period of time where England and France are at war with each other, not only for the control of the continent, but to control of their colonies throughout the world. And again, this period, go, uh, period of conflict is roughly about 200 years. Okay. So along uh, with this conflict though, the nature of land expansion changes dramatically. In this period of time, this is when land becomes alienable. In prior uh, land expansions, for instance, among the Greeks, the Romans, the Turks, the Arabs, uh, the Chinese, uh, land was acquired, but it all belonged to the ruler. And it was at the ruler's discretion uh, who got the land and when, how long they held the land and who to take the land from. It wasn't ownership in the same sense that we understand as in capitalism. So that's one major difference about uh, this West uh, Euro-American expansion, this idea of land as alienable. But the second thing that makes uh, expansion during this period of time, which we are still in, is the centrality of race. Now, this is a contentious point because some people will argue that race as a concept has existed since the beginning of time. I, along with many other scholars, will argue no. Race is a concept that is associated with the emergence of a capitalist world economy. To give you an example of what I mean is that, for instance, you take a country like China. The literal meaning of China in Chinese is Zhongguo. And Zhongguo refers to middle kingdom uh, uh, or middle country. And from the Chinese perspective, uh, there are some historians who, who will claim that China has never been conquered. And for those who even have a basic knowledge, a, a very general knowledge of history, knows that China has been conquered many times. And the Chinese uh, people who argue this will say, yes, it is true, we were conquered, but all the conquerors became Chinese, which meant from their perspective, what was superior about the Chinese was not their race, it was their culture, their ethnicity. And social scientists refer to this uh, phenomena basically as uh, ethnocentrism. You use your own culture as the standard by which you make judgments about all other people. Now, this is also captured in the terms, for instance, barbarian and savage. Barbarian comes from the Greek word meaning Babel. So for the Greeks, the people that they were conquering weren't different racially. They were just people who they didn't understand. From their perspective, the people they were conquering, the language was Babel. Savage, on the other hand, is a Latin word. And again, uh, although it might have to some people the animal uh, idea of bestiality, the word savage comes from simply the word sylvan or from the woods. So from the Roman perspective, people who came from the woods were savages, they were uncivilized. And so those words themselves don't re really reflect racial uh, differences as much as racial, dif um, uh, as ethnic differences. So when we talk about the expansion of Western ca capitalism from Europe to the Americas, we're talking about this tradition that comes with the notion of land is alienable, that race is central. The third corollary of that, if you're going to talk about races, which race is the most prominent? And from the European experience, it was those nations that were white. And so white supremacy is built into the very notion of uh, any kind of land expansion during this era of history. So when people talk about 
uh, white patriarchy, they're not picking on whites just out of the blue. They're talking about of it within a particular historical context. And this historical context is the expansion of capitalism from Europe to the Americas. And along with that white supremacy comes patriarchy. Now, let me go. We can see this patriarchy in terms of the United States, in terms of our founding documents. Uh, the preamble of the declaration simply says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And then the preamble says, we the people of the United States. Now, when we were going through school, we all took the term men and people to be abstract synonyms for human beings. But when the documents were written, they literally meant men when they said the Declaration of Independence. How do we know that? Simply look at how people are constructed in the US Constitution. Uh, first of all, there's no mention at all of women in the Constitution. When the um, people met to write the Constitution, Abigail uh, Adams specifically wrote to her husband with the simple words, remember the women. Okay. But John Adams and all the other men at the Constitutional Convention forgot about the women. Uh, women at that particular time could not own property, they could not inherit property, uh, they couldn't run their financial affairs, okay? and they de definitely did not have the right to vote. So when they talked about people, women were excluded. Their status is what we call in immigration studies is derivative. It's derivative of what the status of the men were. Blacks, we know, uh, were not included as people because slavery is recognized in the Constitution. And in terms of rep representation, they were only counted as three-fifths of a human. Now, Native Americans are mentioned in the Constitution, but only in two cases. <clears throat> One was to recognize the sovereignty of Native Americans, and the other was the ability of uh, provision dealt with entering into treaties with Native Americans. Now, what I want to want to emphasize is that the recognition of Native Americans as sovereign people was not based on the notion that, oh, these are noble savages, they know how to rule themselves. No, it was more based on the notion that you do you, we do us. We're not going to be concerned with you except when we enter into treaties. And so Native Americans had no rights in any American possession. And that was the purpose of excluding them. Asians are not mentioned because Asians have not come to the continental United States yet. And Latinos are not mentioned because at that particular time, Latinos meant Spaniards or people of Spanish descent, and they are European. So they're not specifically mentioned. So it's uh, also reflected in the 1790 naturalization. This is the first act that defines who can become an American citizen. And the act specifically states free white men. So not even all whites were entitled, were initially counted among the people. Okay, otherwise they would have been given the right to become naturalized citizens. Uh, there was a huge number of people at this point in time who were indentured servants, and therefore they were not free. So when you take a look at our basic documents, you can understand that they were really referring to men and they were referring to free white men. Now, 
the concept of uh, manifest destiny actually takes shape is specifically stated in the 1840s. It's developed by an editor by the name of John O'Sullivan. But even as early as the 1690s, you will see that the notion of expansion is already evident. This is a small passage from um, a, uh, perspectives um, for that an agent of colonization had written to encourage people, English people to come to the uh, colonies. And it states, what need we then to fear, but to go up at once as a peculiar people marked and chosen by the finger of God to possess it. And here you see the, all the elements of white a privilege, white, uh, white supremacy, and how religion fits into it. Yeah, whites are seen as peculiar, not in the sense of odd, but as meaning special, a special people blessed by God to, uh, to expand. Now, as Alan Taylor in his presentation to the church noted, that when we talk about um, expand, what the goal of Manifest Destiny was, it changed over time. Initially in the 1600s, when this person is writing, a Manifest Destiny meant controlling the whole Eastern seaboard from Florida all the way up to the Northern parts of Canada. Okay. But then we acquire the old Northwest territories, which was Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio. And then we begin to think about crossing over to um, the Appalachians and expanding to the Mississippi River. But the biggest land ex expansion occurs in 1803. Now, I know people are going to say, well, this was purchased. This is not conquest. And that is true. We purchased it from France, who didn't live in, none of the French people actually lived and controlled the land. They just claimed the territory. We bought it from the French. And in order to uh, settle that territory, we had to engage in the actual conquest of, that, uh, of the people in that particular region. So. During the whole 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, Manifest Destination is really focused on the Westward expansion from the Atlantic coast to the Western coast, the Pacific coast. But in 1898, Manifest Destiny takes on a different meaning. And this is the period of time where first of all, we acquire Hawaii. Hawaii uh, was originally a kingdom, but in 1895, sugar planters overthrow the kingdom and create the Republic of Hawaii that lasts from 1895 to 18, uh, 1898, in which point, at which point they agreed to be annexed by the United States. We also claim uh, uh, or get territory as a result of the Spanish-American War in 1898. So we received Puerto Rico, we received Guam, and we received the Philippines. And then we also acquired Cuba, which we established as a protectorate. So at that point, uh, Manifest Destiny takes on an international dimension. Now, why? In this expansion westward, would there be a need for new labor? Well, first of all, we all know from uh, our history from elementary school on that many of the indigenous people died because of Western disease, exposure to Western disease. They just didn't have the immunity of it. But what often is not told about that story is that far more people died by demoralization. And what this simply means is that as people began to die and as Westerners introduced uh, so abusive substances, in this case, alcohol, that the native people, the indigenous people of this land uh, began to undergo a demoralization. 
And this is the same thing that happened, for instance, uh, introduction of opium into China. The people were exposed to opium, they began to abuse it. And as a result, they no longer could perform their normal daily functions. And so the combination of diseases and demoralization really hindered the ability of people to work the land. But there was also genocide that was occurring. Now, genocide is a hard concept for us to ex uh, accept because people will say, often say, well, yes, Indians were killed, but it's not the genocide like the Holocaust that killed 6 million Jews plus 3 other million uh, Europeans. It's not like the uh, genocide that occurred in Cambodia where over 2 million people were killed, nor is it not the genocide that occurs in places like Ethiopia, uh, uh, the Hutu and Tutsui uh, civil war, which hundreds of thousands of people are killed. But that's to mistaken uh, the means of committing genocide with the intent of genocide. We killed more people because we technically became more proficient at killing people. That's why the numbers of people who are killed in the modern period is so much larger than in the past. But genocide refers to trying to exterminate the people to remove them from the land. And that occurred in the United States as we were crossing uh, to uh, expand to the West Coast. And it even incurred in California. One of the first acts in California was to create a fund that paid bounties for the lives of, uh, uh, for those Native Americans who were killed. I'm going to read you something to show you uh, the extent of that uh, thing. Now, let's see. Now, this is a hearing that occurs in the 1860s by the state legislature. And the person that is talking is a, a person by the name of William Frazier. And he's describing his participation in the Mendocino Indian Wars of 1860. He testified that he and a group of white men visited an uh, Indian ranchiera or village in Mendocino County for the purpose of chastising the Indians for the ostensible theft, not the actual theft, the ostensible theft of three head of cattle. Hearing that Indians in one particular ranchera had some beef, they descended upon the village and when all fled but one, we shot his head off. Sometimes later, Frazier, as a member of a 40-man company of local citizens, ventured on an expedition after some Yucca Indians believed to be responsible for depredations in Mendocino's County's Long Valley. According to Frazier, who was elected lieutenant of the volunteer company, we left Long Valley in the evening and traveled in the night until we saw the fire of an Indian ranchera which ranchiera we surrounded when day was breaking and when waited until near sunup before we attacked and killed 20 consisting of bucks, squaws, and children. We found in this ranchiera no signs of any deprivations having been committed to these Indians. And then it goes on to talk about his further uh, acts of killing people a few weeks later. So genocide was occurring even in places like California. Now there's one additional factor that it's why it's hard to control uh, indigenous people in a, in a labor force. And that's because these people have lived on the lands for centuries. They didn't need the white men to survive. They knew how to survive. And so whenever they got an opportunity to run, they ran and they wouldn't be caught. 
So the purpose of acquiring new labor, uh, what they call new and cheap labor, is to acquire people who are not familiar with the land that uh, has been conquered. And also, here's where race becomes a factor, they stick out. You know, when Native Americans ran, they ran into where their tribal lands were, they ran to other Native uh, indigenous tribes. Okay. But if you look different, it's very hard to hide in the general population. So where was this new labor going to come from? Okay, it couldn't come from the South because in 1850, California uh, uh, was admitted as a free state after much uh, civil conflict, it was admitted as a free state. So Blacks uh, were not uh, acquirable, but they were not also directly acquirable because of two major developments that happened during the 1830s. Uh, <clears throat> one was that the British enacted in 1883 a provision that ended chattel slavery within it its colonies, but it also effectively ended the worldwide slave trade from Africa. Okay. Basically, they said, if we don't want chattel slavery, then we have to cut off the source. Many of you may remember the movie Amistad, where uh, Blacks uh, rebelled against uh, the slave owning ship and sailed it into Boston, and they went on trial, and oh, John Adams represented them. Over time, they were freed. Um, they were not held. They were not considered guilty of mutiny. Uh, they were given their freedom. Uh, the end of the film shows uh, ships bombing the forts in Africa to stop this slave trade. But what most people didn't probably didn't realize is that they were not showing American ships. They were showing British ships that were bombing these forts to end the slavery trade. So this, the ending of slavery, however, did not mitigate the need for cheap labor. So the British turned to Asia to get what was uh, later known as indentured or contract labor. And the movement of people from Asia was huge. It is estimated that somewhere between 9 million and 20 million Africans were taken from their continent to the new world. The British in the period between 1830 and World War II moved somewhere between 32 and 45 million Indians throughout the world. This is why when you go to places in the South Pacific like Fiji, the majority of population of Fiji are people of Indian descent. Or you go throughout any place in Southeast Asia, you will find Indian communities. Or Africa, Indian, especially on the East Coast, Indian communities. Okay. They also got uh, use of the Chinese, but because they didn't control China in the way they did in China, uh, India, uh, the amount of Chinese that the British transported was much smaller. But Americans participated in, in the uh, movement of Chinese through different parts of the world. And it is estimated that again, between 1830 and World War II, somewhat like 25 million Chinese were transported to different parts of the world. That's why virtually wherever you go in the world, you can, there's a good chance you will find a Chinatown. I remember going to Peru and I walked in the store and there was a Chinese owner. And he said, yeah, Chinatown's right around the corner. I went to Italy. Uh, we were staying in a place outside of uh, Venice. I walked around the corner and I walked right into a Chinatown. Okay. This was all part of that early migration that occurred where these people went all around the world. Okay. Now, the second important development was that in turning to Asia, was that 
after the American Revolution, okay, the British did as much as they could to keep Americans out of Europe. You know, they were bitter about losing the war, which is understandable. So they hindered American trade as much as possible. Remember, this was one of the major factors that led to the War of 1812. So what did Americans, how did Americans respond? Well, they responded by turning to Asia. And what they did was they found two goods that the Chinese were willing to trade with the Americans. And those two goods were whales. American whaling in the North Pacific became a major industry, okay? Because whaling in that particular period of time was not only important for things like food, but whaling oil was a major fuel, for instance, the lighting of the lamps. Uh, it was also used uh, as part of the whale that uh, you, was valuable in the creation of perfumes and things of that nature. The other product they found was here in the Pacific Northwest, furs. Okay. These were two items that the Chinese were willing to accept. Now, the reason I say willing to accept is that at this point in time, Chinese really didn't, weren't interested in Western products. Whenever they traded with the West, they say, you pay us in specie or gold, uh, gold or silver, I mean, or you give us products that we're interested in. Well, the British and the Americans, neither one of them had specie. They didn't have gold, they didn't have silver, because they spent it all in all the constant wars that were going on in Europe and then between the colonies and Great Britain. So Britain found its product with opium. So they introduced opium into the country. The United States found whales and uh, furs. Now, in order to reach the Northwest and to the uh, whale, uh, whaling grounds, they had to sail from the Northeast all the way down around the Cape Horn to here. This is a voyage that took approximately anywhere from three to six months. So by the time they got to the Pacific, they needed a place to stop, to refill uh, their larders with fresh fruit, of uh, fresh food, especially fruit and water. And this is where the Hawaiian Islands become important. Uh, you can see from the, the map that the Hawaiian Islands are virtually almost dead center between the North American continent and Asia. It's approximately 3,200 miles from San Francisco or later Los Angeles. It's about 3,500 miles to Japan, about 3,500 miles to, this is approximately Hong Kong here, and Canton. And so they stopped at the islands there, they were a few, then they would go spend another year catching whales or gathering furs, and then they would come back to the islands again, and then they would go to China. Now, in the Hawaiian Islands, they actually found a third product that uh, the Chinese were interested in, and that was sandalwood, which was used to make incense. And that's just why, in Chinese, the Hawaiian Islands are referred to as the Sandalwood Islands. Okay. Now, this is important, these trade routes that were established, because it creates the transportation and computer uh, transportation and communication networks between Asia and China, uh, Asia and the United States. Now, these this. These networks, though, don't come into full use until the gold rush. The gold rush is what ignites uh, that uh, infrastructure. Okay. Now, I want to show you why that labor was necessary in places uh, in California. You can see from this chart that the population of the United States in 1850 is only about 23 million people. And it's all concentrated, or practically all concentrated 
east of the Mississippi. In California, in 1848, it's not yet a state, but it's estimated that the population was only about uh, under 10,000 people. 1850, there's now 92,000 people. And this is all because of the gold rush of uh, Discovery Gold in 1848. Okay. This is how many people, another 80,000 people come in. Okay. Now, at that period of time, there are only about 450 Chinese. Okay, not very much. 1860, the population has now grown because of the uh, population, not only of the entry of the Chinese, but also natural population growth and more people coming from the East. Here at this particular point, Chinese represent just under 10% of the population, but they're 20% of the labor force. Here in 1870, they're now over 10% of the population, and they represent about 25 to 30% of the labor population. Now, I just want to give you a quick overview of the occupational profile of uh, the Chinese, because this is the profile that all subsequent minority people follow. Between 1850 and 1880s, okay, most of the Chinese who lived in Hawaii and California, they live in rural areas. Okay, there were professionals, there were merchants and artisans, but the overwhelming majority of Chinese were contract laborers. Uh, in Hawaii, it was almost all on the plantation. In California, it was a little bit diverse. Initially, when they came, they came as independent gold placer miners. Now, I want to emphasize placer mining because this is the type of mining that we refer to as panning for gold. Uh, this is the type of mining that is labor intensive, but not capital intensive. All right. And so during the 50s and 60s, uh, during the 1850s, most Chinese are miners. Okay, they're not working for anybody, they're working for themselves, but they're working in companies. This is why, even though many laws are passed to chase the Chinese off the mines, they stay on the placer mining because most Americans didn't find placer mining very profitable. But Chinese using their agricultural skills were able to divert water, use flumes, sluicing as a way of increasing the efficiency of getting gold from water, the water streams that were flowing by. American uh, miners were not able to do that because most we know that most American miners were urban populations, were from urban populations that have been long removed from any agriculture. Then during the 60s, we see a growth in railroad construction. Now we all know about the Chinese participating in the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869. Okay, what we don't always recognize is that almost 20,000 Chinese were assembled to create that uh, workforce and until the 1890s, that was the largest industrial workforce ever assembled at that time. Okay, it isn't until the 1890s that factories and industries are able to purchase more, uh, assemble more than 20,000 people in a single spot. And then after the construction of railroad, many of these railroad workers were released, although they continued to work on the railroads, uh, building trunk lines. Uh, we think about the Transcontinental Railroad, which is going east and west. But remember, the railroads now had to go north and south. And many of the Chinese remain doing that particular task, building the trunk lines, for instance, from Sacramento to Los Angeles or from uh, Los Angeles, I mean, or from Sacramento up to Washington, okay. And as a result, uh, they uh, do railroad construction in the 1870s uh, as well, but the large majority now become independent 
tenant farmers, okay? In other words, they're going into agriculture. It isn't until the 1880s after the pa uh, passage of the Chinese exclusion law that you begin to find large urban Chinese communities. Uh, up until this time, it's all located in rural areas. Okay. Now, the purpose of acquiring Chinese labor, again, is to bring in cheap labor, but cheap, again, not meaning not only paying them lower wages, but also in their ability to control that labor. Again, bringing people from another land in the United States makes them what labor historians used to use this term amenable labor, meaning that they could be more easily controlled. And the way you would do this would be by limiting the opportunities as in independent entrepreneurs. So for instance, the Chinese miners were hindered by a foreign miners tax, which basically only they pa uh, paid. Um, they were pay, uh, hindered by, for instance, restrictive laundry laws. San Francisco passed a law that uh, you needed a license to engage in the laundry trade. If you had one horse, you paid $2. If you had two horses, you paid $4. But if you carried your laundry on poles, you had to pay $15, and they later reduced it to 12. So these are the kinds of laws that restricted the Chinese from engaging in enterprises of their own. They also began the practice of segregation, putting Chinese into uh, small ghettos. And they were denying them political and legal asset, access to readdress justices. So for instance, in 1850, again, uh, under the People versus Hall Act, uh, the California Supreme Court uh, rules that Native Americans, African Americans, and Chinese are not allowed to testify against whites in court. And this law isn't a repeal until the 1870s. So for a 20 year period, uh, Chinese are not allowed to testify directly against people who offend them. And uh, they could only do so if they had some whites who were willing to testify uh, on their behalf. Now, how bad was this denial of political and legal access? Well, I'm just going to read very briefly some phrases from a gazetteer that was passed out by Wells Fargo. And this gazetteer was a manual that was passed to Chinese who were coming into California. And it consisted of phrases that they thought the Chinese needed to know. So what kind of phrases did they think Chinese needed to know at this particular period of time? Well, it's things like, he took it from me by violence. I made an apology, but still he wants to strike me. He assaulted me without provocation. The house was set on fire by an incendiary. He tried to obtain my baggage by false premises. He claimed my mind. He squatted on my lot. He defrauded me out of my salary. He tries to extort money from me. They're going to extort a confession from him by false pretenses. The confession was extorted from him by force. These are the kind of phrases that people thought Chinese needed to know at that particular time. So the purpose of these restrictive laws uh, is to create conditions that would compel the Chinese to either leave that particular area or even to return to China. And whenever possible, these local uh, ordinances or state ordinances uh, they try to legalize it at a national level. Now, if you think about it, what's currently happening in today's immigration, you see the same kinds of things occurring. 
Well, I am going to talk about two particular national restrictions on the Chinese. One is called the Page Act of 1875, and the other one is the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And as you will notice, okay, the Page Act was barred the entry of Asian women. Now, this law was actually a prostitution law, and it was designed to prevent prostitutes from coming in to the United States, which makes sense, uh, given you know, they don't want to encourage moral vice. However, what makes this law discriminatory was that the assumption that every Chinese woman entering the United States was a prostitute. And therefore they had to undergo three separate physical examinations. One by the Chinese to affirm that A, this was, a, uh, this was the person's wife and that she was not engaged in prostitution. When they got to uh, Guang, uh, Canton or Guangzhou, uh, they were examined by the British doctors who controlled the ports. And then when they went on to American ships, they were examined a third time by American physicians to, again, indicate that they, they were clean, that they had no uh, venereal diseases of any sort. Uh, the purpose of this law was very clearly to prevent wives from joining the husbands. Then there's the Chinese exclusion of 1882, which is our first national immigration law. Okay. And it's the only law ever to specifically target an ethnic or racial group. Hawaii, which is still independent at this time, copies part of this law. And made three major provisions of it. It barred the entry of Chinese laborers. Chinese could still come in only if they were merchants, diplomats, ministers, or students. Okay. And the second thing, it barred the entry of wives of Chinese laborers already here. And the last one is denied to Chinese the right to national, uh, naturalize. If you go back to the earlier screen I showed you, if you want to control a population, what do you do? You limit their abilities to engage in labor. So you bar laborers from coming in. You don't want them to bring over wives because that means that they will form families. <clears throat> and when people have the ability to form families, then that makes uh, creates a commitment to stay where they are. And if you deny them rights, basic civil rights of society, <clears throat> then you're basically telling them, go home. And again, look at the similarities to current immigration practices. Now, the importance of these acts are several four. First of all, they create a template that is used in relation to the future immigration of people. So when it, although it first applied to Chinese, it's later exp uh, expanded to the Japanese, Filipinos, Koreans, Asian Indians, okay? Uh, and again, you can still see that logic being practiced in the contemporary period. But it's second of all, it points out to one of the major distinctions between racial discrimination and ethnic discrimination. People I hear all the time argue, well, all groups were discriminated against. That is true. Every immigrant group, whether you were for Norwegian or German, Irish, Italian, they were all discriminated against. But none of those white ethnic groups or ethnically defined groups ever faced what racially defined groups were. First of all, the ability to immigrate. They have while European immigration was restricted, it was never barred. Okay. This only occurred first in relationship to Asians, 
but later to Latinos as well. The second thing is family formation. Okay. No ethnically defined group has ever been denied the right to bring their families over. But this was true of every single uh, racially defined group. Not only were they denied the ability to form families, they were denied the ability to maintain their families. So in the cases of Native Americans, for instance, children were taken away from them to engage or to be forcefully assimilated into white societies, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Africans during the slave period, African-Americans, their children were taken away from them. Their wives were taken away and sold to different places, right? So this doesn't happen to white uh, uh, ethnically defined groups. And the last thing is none of these ethnically defined groups have ever been denied the right to become citizens. Okay. Uh, sure, they faced many discrimination in voting and things like that, but they were never the right, denied the right to become citizens. Chinese aren't eligible to become citizens until 1840, uh, 1948. Japanese in 1952. Uh, Native Americans, 1924. Blacks twice, 1865, 1965. Okay. So if you want to understand the difference between ethnic and racial discrimination, focus on those three items. The third thing that the two acts do is they show you why there is serial immigration among Asians and then later among other non-Asians groups. And we'll go back to here. Notice in the period of 1860 to 1890, this is the peak of Chinese migration to the entire United States, okay? Uh, once that population begins tapering off because there no people are no longer allowed to enter, notice the increase in the Japanese population. Okay, it becomes larger and larger. Now, Japanese immigration is restricted in 1907 and 1920, but it continues to grow because Japanese were the only Asian group that were able to bring in families. And that's because the United States was fearful of Japan's rising power and didn't want to offend the Japanese initially. So initially they allowed them to bring in their wives. After 1920, that no longer became possible. But as Japanese became dominant, particularly in agriculture on the Pacific coast, they wanted to replace the Japanese. And so they begin this uh, large-scale immigration of uh, Filipinos. Now, I included uh, the population of Los Angeles to, to make a point. Notice that in 1900, there are only 102,000 um, people living in Los Angeles. Less than 10% of that population is of Mexican ancestry. And why that is important, it means that uh, they have not migrated past Los Angeles into the Central uh, Valley yet. So the Central Valley labor agriculture is still controlled by Japanese and then starting with Filipino labor. It isn't until the end of World War, uh, during World War I, that you begin to get a larger influx of Latinos coming uh, moving into the Central Valley. Uh, so during this period of time, this is only in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, do Latinos start to come in in large numbers. And if I extended it out to the 2000s, you would see other Lat Latinos coming in larger numbers because we don't want to rely only on Mexican labor. So that shows you the serial nature of uh, labor migration into a place like California. Now, there are certain points that I just want to conclude by have, making people aware of certain points that I would like you to take away from this. And that is, first of all, we need to think about 
historical periods in much broader frameworks. We can't think of it only as in 100 years or 200 years, but in this case, if we go back to uh, the start of uh, Euro-American dominance, global dominance, we're going back 500 years. And when you take in that time span, you begin to understand why uh, people, when they attack racial discrimination, they're always talking about structural discrimination. Because over that 500 year period, we have developed a society whose social organization uh, and the psyches of individually and collectively have been shaped by what has happened during that 500 year period. It seems strange to say it, but racism is a tradition. If it lasts 500 years, you certainly have the right to call it a tradition. Okay. The second thing I would like people to remember is that the commodification of land, water, air requires the use of labor to transfer, uh, transform these resources into profit-making enterprises. And many of these jobs are associated with what we call 3D jobs. 3D jobs are jobs that are considered dangerous, uh, <clears throat> uh, dirty, dangerous, and deadly. Okay. And these jobs will continue to, uh, continue to exist and will continue to exist into the near future. And they will continue to consist primarily of people who are poor, people of color, and women. Okay. Now, I didn't uh, talk about this point, but I'll talk about it now. Race is an unstable social contract, meaning that the what constitutes uh, race and who is included is a changing notion. And I'm just going to mention, I should have mentioned earlier, these two particular Supreme Court decisions. In 1922, there, the case is known as Ozawa versus the United States. Ozawa was a person who was born in Japan, but raised in Hawaii, came to the uh, mainland to receive his education, served in World War I, uh, was distinguished uh, as a soldier, and then he was engaged, I think, as a, a journalist. He goes to the Supreme Court and he says, I should be uh, granted the right to naturalize because of my service to my country and what I'm contributing presently contributing to the community. The Supreme Court rules, no, Ozawa, you're Japanese, Japanese are Mongolians, and since we excluded Mongolians through the Chinese, you are not eligible for citizenship. So he's denied citizenship. The next year, in a case, uh, Thin versus um, the US, Thin is an Asian Indian who was born uh, in India, but raised in the United States, again, served in the military. But he comes up with his argument saying, anthropologically speaking, Asian Indians are Aryans. And if they are Aryans, they are white. And the Supreme Court rules, yes, you are correct. Scientifically, you are considered white. But in the common notion of white, you are not white, that people in general would never consider you to be white, and therefore you are ineligible for citizenship. And that's what I mean by race as an unstable uh, construct. The fourth point I would like to emphasize is that, notice my discussion focused mainly on Asians. Okay. Why? Because on the West Coast, and in Hawaii, the major racial dynamics surround first native, uh, the indigenous population, and then the Asians who were brought in. So why race is considered a national and an international, it's always understood locally. And that's why uh, the need to talk about Asians, particularly on the West Coast and in Hawaii. And finally, if you also notice, we cannot 
understand race in a silo. We always have to consider it in terms of its intersection with other forms of social dif differentiation and discrimination, such as classism, sexism, gender identity, and so on. And this was so clear in the contemporary uh, election where abortion was a major issue, but it wasn't only a woman's issue, it's an economic issue. It reflects class, the difference in class, the ability of women to receive abortion services. Rich people have never been affected by the ability to get abortion. It's also a gender issue. Why is it only women that we're focusing, not on men? Well, how about let's engage in some legal vasectomy of men or something like that? It's a gender issue about how women think about who they are as women. And so the same thing is true of race. When we talk about race, we can never really talk only about race. We need to talk about it in conjunction with uh, other things. So with that, I'll end and I'll welcome any uh, questions or comments or issues you would like to raise. John. Oh, Julia, oh, Julia go ahead. They, they can't speak. Oh, they um, can't speak, okay. You'd send, send your questions to me and I will share them. Um, it looks like we have a question from, let's see, so can, why or how does SHIF come from wanting migration as a way to build a particular labor force, for instance, on the plantations in Hawaii or the railroads in California, to excluding the same population, for example, the Chinese Exclusion Act? What causes the shift with each succeeding wave of migration from Asia? Need. That's the simple one. If you need, uh, people, you get them. But if those people become adaptive to American society and they begin to make a place in society, then they're no longer as control, controllable. Notice who leads the DACA movement, who leads uh, these immigration fights. These are people who have been here a long time. These are the ones that have now a vested interest in continuing to live here. Okay. These are the ones that begin to fight. And once they begin to fight, they are no longer as desirable as a labor force. And so people will go to look for cheaper labor forces. Juliet. I know I know Juliet had a question if you can unmute her. Let me see if I can uh, find her uh, Julie, one, one yeah. moment. While Gabe is is doing that, um, I just wanted to thank you for that answer. That was that was my question that you just answered and it makes it makes so much sense. I grew up in Hawaii as I think you know and uh, we did we we never learned we were very well aware that there were many different waves of immigration um but we never learned the history of of why so mm -hmm. we didn't we never had really an explanation for the population that we were all a part of as part of our regular curriculum so this is fascinating thank you well in hawaii they make it visibly apparent the serial migration because uh the oahu sugar company which is in uh, iaea is a perfect example on top of the hill are the white plantation members. Right below them are the Lunas who were Portuguese and Spanish descent. And below them were the Chinese workers and Japanese workers who were the longest workers. And at the bottom of the hill were the Filipinos. And this is where all the excrement flowed from up the hill down to the bottom. And so you, got a, you have a visual representation of the hierarchy as well as the time of these different immigrant groups, uh, immigrant groups coming in. Mm -hmm. Julia, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, John. This has been absolutely fascinating. And 
I guess I was wondering if you could extrapolate a little bit and talk more about the the project of of dismantling racism and structural racism, um, and if you if you've seen trends towards um, and and this you've you've got such a historical knowledge where you think it's most effective to focus um, where do you think social movements um, for um, you know immigrant rights to to be fully naturalized and to be integrated you know how how do you think that they've been most effective over time you know are there are there ways that you can extrapolate some of the lessons as as you've seen different immigrant groups be able to integrate better than others over time um, and kind of how that plays out in today's, you know, strati stratified racist <laughs> uh, layers of racism within existing, you know, today's society. I think I'll answer in several ways. First, if the e answer was easy, the people in this group could have figured it out. Okay. So the answer is not easy. The second thing is, if we put it in broader perspective, understand we're not dealing with something that just exists in the United States. It exists throughout this period of Euro-American dominance. And again, that's a 500 year period. And we are talking about things and practices that have become so embedded that people no longer have to consciously think about it. You know, you just go around, that's the way it has always been. Okay. The, I think the obvious tact and what the civil rights movement has been taking is we basically first have to change the laws. Okay. Legalization means a lot because legalization gives you a voice. Without legalization, your voice is very, very limited. So people have to have the right to be able to elect people that represent them. They have to be able to write to go to courts. They have to be able to write to contribute to some of the benefits that they are contributing to. Many people do not or may, may not be aware that undocumented immigrants are one reason why our social security is still afloat because they contribute social security. It is mandatory but they will never collect on it until they become citizens. And so when you deny them legal rights, then they're making contributions, but they're not going to receive any benefits. Now, I will say that the United States and European countries over time have now begun to extend or try to extend those rights but because the privileges that are embedded in the system, there is so much resistance. That's why it's so hard to change laws because people realize they're gonna be losing something and that's what they're afraid of. And the argument in reality is that they're not really losing anything. They're actually contributing to greater productivity. Back in the 1980s, uh, what we found that uh, there was a study called uh, the fourth wave, and it referred to Latino uh, migration. And what they found was Latino migration didn't compete with Blacks at all. Uh, it elevated the status of Blacks. And the example that the study used was the California Department of Motor Vehicles. When you went to the Department of Motor Vehicles, in uh, the 1950s and 40s and 60s, it was all white. When Latinos came up, you noticed a considerable change in the personnel. It became much more noticeably black because the uh, migrants that were moving in were sort of elevating the blacks up the scale. So legalization is uh, not only uh, ne necessary for people to represent themselves, to voice themselves, but it is also a way of increasing productivity and the mobility and the economic well-being of uh, the community. Uh, I don't know how many people have read the news lately, but California is on the verge of becoming the fourth largest economy in the world, displacing Germany. 
And part of the fact is because we have such a diverse labor force that is productive, that our production is allowing us to become the possibly the fourth largest economy in the world by the end of this decade. Thank you, John. Um, our next question is, um, uh, someone says, I read recently that in the 1890 to 1920 period, there was an effort by Protestant Americans to define what it truly meant to be American, quote unquote, by using manifest destiny and a part of that effort resulted in whitewashing the Thanksgiving origin story we all learn in school of the peaceful feast between Native Americans and the pilgrims, whereas the truth of what happened in Massachusetts at the time was much more grim, resulting in the observation of the National Day of Mourning embraced by some of our First Nations on people um, on Thanksgiving Day. Have you heard of this? Yes. Uh, not only is the story gruesome, but that story is also one of the ways of explaining why there's a big difference how race is treated in the United States and Latin America. As early as the early 1500s, there was a debate within the Spanish colonial empire about whether Native Americans were capable of salvation. And Bartolomeu de la Casas was a Catholic priest who argued that yes, they are human like we are, and therefore they are capable of salvation. Now the Christian missionaries who went to uh, the North America initially came with uh, that orientation as well. But the King's Philip War in Massachusetts in mid 1600s was a very brutal war and people on both sides died in fairly large numbers. And after that, there's a noticeable orientation within the Protestant churches that Native Americans are not uh, capable of salvation, okay? And this uh, contributes in large part to that orientation uh, that allows them to engage in the genocide of Native Americans because they didn't see them as humans in the same sense. And it was also reflected in the argument between monogenesis and polygenesis. The Catholics were arguing monogenesis, that we all people come from the same source. Uh, the Protestants at this particular period of time say, no, different races, different sources. They're not human in the same way that we are. So yeah, that, uh, that was, uh, that's part of that whole discussion uh, that sacred, uh, uh, that the, the, the discussion you're mentioning. Thank you. And um, if anyone else has any questions, go ahead and send them in. Um, that's the last question, but I do have a comment from Carol um, who wants to, wants me to let everyone know that if you want to explore racism and racial reconciliation our next sacred ground dialogue circle will begin on november 27th and wrap up in may if you're interested um, email carol or contact the church office um, by november 20th um, any other questions go ahead and send them in or raise your hand and i'll unmute you if not i'll pass it on to uh, pamela i don't see anything else coming in just a wonderful presentation. I am, well, first of all, I'm so grateful to you for giving of your time and expertise to this, but I'm especially grateful that it was recorded because I know there's just so much um, detailed information in there that I want to go back and as I'm kind of mulling over things. Um, and even though I've done sacred ground circles twice now, this, there's, there's just always more to learn and um, you presented it flawlessly so that I could really, really follow. Um, and it's, it's difficult, it's, it's difficult history um, to learn or relearn or um, just to, to grapple with together. So thank you. It was my pleasure. Wow. We have a, a great, we've had a great fall lineup. We are working on thinking about some movie opportunities um, and I know it's on our website, but I don't remember exactly the, 
a film that's coming up that people can watch on their own. Um, so we're going to be be talking about some movies that people can watch and then come together to talk about. We're also hoping to show some movies in person. And do you want to give a plug for that before we go? Yeah. So I'll plug John. Oh, John can do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll plug John. Well, Messiah uh, Church in Santa Ana has been running a discussion a film series. And what they do is they have people watch films because more, many people have Netflix, uh, uh, looking at different films and then coming together to discuss it. And most of the films deal with some aspect of social or environmental justice. And the next film uh, is coming up that refers, uh, it's going to be dealing with the murder of the 48 stu uh, teacher students in Mexico and uh, why this uh, issue is of importance, not only to Mexicans, but to other Americans. Great. And there are, there are links um, that Gabe through the sanctuary has put in the chat um, and feel free to just, you know, contact the church and we'll get you the information about those upcoming um, movie discussion opportunities and other things um, as they as they are scheduled. And uh, boy, this was just this this. I love the way you tied in so many of the earlier talks too. It just it was it was really wonderful. Anne, would you like the last word? Uh, no, I want you to have the last word. I just want to put a plug in to John. I do appreciate him saying yes to our request for speaking another time to Church of St. Martin. For our many visitors who are uh, coming into St. Martin's to hear the talk, I especially appreciate your interest and that you can always find out about these movie discussions by checking the church website. There will be a, uh, and you can get on the list by just letting the communication person know that you are interested in particular for the movie discussion. It's a unique opportunity to hear two professors facilitate. Biff Baker is a Russian professor down in Orange County, a good friend of ours from Messiah Church. And he has been doing movie discussions for a very long time. When we lived in Irvine for a long time, I wanted John to facilitate with Biff, but it didn't work out. So this is like a 20 year dream come true that this is actually gonna work and the richness and having locational uh, input, a Northern and a Southern California uh, response to these <laughs> environmental and social justice movies, I think offer a lot of perspectives a lot of perspectives because moving here to Davis, I've noticed just there's just a cultural change for us that we have been adjusting to. So the next movie I will put in chat while Pamela gives her last remarks. Okay, thank you. I really just want to thank everyone for coming. I know some of you, this might have been your first Seeds of Justice um, event. So please do go onto our website and you can see information about other presentations we've had. Some of, the, some of them were recorded, some we just uh, have other kinds of uh, um, slides and things that you can look at. And especially, um, I hope you will consider looking into that sacred ground circle that's coming up. Um, many of us on here have, have been through that curriculum at least once. And it has been the jumping off point for a lot of other things that uh, we've been working on as a church and a community. And so thank you. We'll let you know as other things come, come up. And um, thank you again to John for just another, let's all give him like whatever the round of applause is on, um, on Zoom. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.